pray. Amen. All right, well, um, today um, I, was, I started a lesson a couple weeks ago on uh, the three parts of man, and we didn't really get quite through that, but um, that, that could have turned into a lengthy study, but we cut off at a good point uh, where I can pick that study up later. And, and the reason um, we're going to hold off on that later is, is we're going we're gonna to break off for that. We're going to talk about um, something that's been talked about since uh, the days of Paul. Jesus talked about it. Um, and it's called the mark. Um, you know, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about this mark, what it is, what it isn't. Uh, this could uh, take us a couple, two or three weeks, and that's fine. Uh, we're going to begin. A, a, this is not the Revelation study I was talking about. Uh, but it's a good precursor to it. I haven't determined whether or not um, uh, we're going to do that on Sunday evenings or on Wednesday nights, because uh, that, that's going to be a pretty uh, lengthy study, and uh, we'll be uh, not only in the book of Revelation through that study, but we'll also be covering the book of Daniel through it, and it can get pretty lengthy, but it's an exciting study. and um, it's, it's one of those studies that I think you just keep redoing it and redoing it and redoing it, and, and God just continues to bless you for it. And as a matter of fact, the book of Revelation, you get a special blessing for understanding that book. And um, it's the only book in the Bible that says that. So um, these things in Revelation are very important, not only to um, this, this dispensation of grace that we're in right now, but um, it, it's very important as far as history is concerned and as far as the future is concerned. And uh, if you notice the trend, if you look at history, history always tends to repeat itself. It's just different people and different items, but the, the same purpose is accomplished through it all. And uh, it's that ever, uh, everlasting battle between God and, and unrighteousness. And, and uh, you know, people, whether they want to admit it or not, are on one side or the other. You, you can't be in the middle on that. You're either on God's side or you're, you're on uh, uh, the devil's side, uh, Satan's side. Uh, you, you can't be... Um, you're either for God or you're against Him. There's just no black and white there. And uh, God made it very clear in the book of, uh, when we were speaking about Joshua, He made it very clear in the book of Revelation. There's going to be two sides. And God is going to divide those sides up with righteousness. So um, it's important that we understand that. So we're going to break off from that study we started a couple Wednesdays ago. And um, the question um, that, th the reason that, that I feel it's a good time to do this and talk about this, this thing called a mark is because I've had a few questions over the last couple weeks through this time of, you know, is this the mark? Is that the mark? And, and the reality of it is, is Scripture, Scripture. You, you, you can take current events and try to interpret Scripture with it all day long. You're going to get yourself messed up. Uh, you don't want to do that. Um, so we're going we're gonna to read some Scriptures concerning these matters. Um, you know, I've, I, I've asked some people around. Um, I've heard things over my lifetime uh, one of the big things now is injections and vaccines, uh, a fear of, of trust in the government. And, and honestly, I don't trust the government as far as I can throw them. I never have. I never will. Um, you know, they're, they're powerful men and women that are, um, they've got motives. And, and even uh, some of those that uh, truly are Christians, you know, they're politicians. It's what they are. And then they tend to a lot of times put that before their Christianity. That's just the job, I guess. And I'm not pointing fingers, but that's the job. And um, so um, I, I've had people tell me that, well, they're going to inject these little uh, microscopic uh, diodes and types of things like that, this technology, into people's hands, and, and that's the mark. All right, I've heard that. Um, I, I've heard um, that it's um, uh, a thing that the New World Order is doing, and there's a such thing as the New World Order. It's a, it's a one-world government. Uh, it's been... Uh, talked about in the Bible. It's Daniel talked about it. Revelation talks about it. Jesus talked about it. I mean, all these things are, are, are things that people have said are the mark. And, and, um, then, but we're going to read some scriptures on the mark, and we're going to talk about what it is and what it isn't. And I want you to turn uh, to Genesis chapter 4. Actually, go to Revelation first, Revelation chapter 13. And here's what the Bible says in verse 15, um, in 16, 17, and 18. It said, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Three different things there. 
Uh, here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is a number of man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. And what that is, that is the that is what's called six six six. That is the 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 mark, uh, or the um, the number of of the beast. And what those numbers represent, um, six is the number of man in, in biblical numerology. That's the number of man. Six six is the number of degenerate man. All right. Six 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 is the number of the father of degenerate man. And we know who that is. That's that's the devil. That's the father of the lie. Um, and that's something very interesting in that scripture we quoted as the father of lies. No, he's the father of the lie, the Bible says. And it's a specific lie uh, that he's the father of. And it's where a lot of heresy is, is, is brought out. And we won't cover that, but uh, that's something to look into. Every little word in this Bible is important. Every one of them. The ors, the ands, the thes, the, uh, the, all that stuff is important if you want to understand uh, what the Word of God is talking about. So let's pray. Dear Lord God, we come to you. Thank you, Lord, for your book. God, give us wisdom, give us understanding, and help it, God, to uh, uh, relieve uh, some of the fears that a lot of the world is experiencing right now over, uh, Lord, these things in Revelation. God, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so turn over to Genesis chapter 4, verse 15. Um, there's a, a type of Bible study, and, and I've used it for uh, many years. Uh, there's all kinds of techniques of studying this Bible that, that helps you to understand some things. And, and the first and foremost thing that I learned very early on about words is this, this, this uh, rule um, in the Bible, in Bible study, and it's called uh, the rule of first mentions. And I've, I've mentioned that before. And uh, what it is is basically the first mention of a word is usually pretty determinant on the root meaning of that word the rest of, uh, uh, the, rest of the Bible. And if you turn to Genesis chapter 4, verse 15, you find the first time the word mark is mentioned in the Bible. And this is a mark that God put on a man. In verse 15 it says this. It says, And the Lord said unto him, speaking to Cain, Whosoever slay, or speaking of Cain, Whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. All right, so Cain killed his brother, killed Abel, and uh, God knew he did. God called him out on it, and God said, Get out. Um, but he knew that Cain was going to have trouble uh, so he put a mark on Cain to keep him safe. Um, and it says this, And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, and then here's why, lest any find in him should kill him. Now let me ask you something. According to the law of first mentions, is this a mark, just like the Bible says it is? Or is it something else? Is it, is it a piece of merchandise that's embedded in his hand or in his forehead? Is it, is it a card that he carries or an identification or a social security number? It's a mark, isn't it? It's a mark. The word mark in the Bible means mark. Uh, you, 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 you can't um, take current events and determine Scripture by those current events. You get yourself in trouble. You need to take Scripture and let it explain the current events. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people, when they study these Bibles and what's going on in their time, they use that to interpret what the Scriptures are. And uh, we're going to go on with this. Um, the mark was from God, and it was put there to protect Cain. It's not a number. It's a mark. And it's, uh, what's interesting about the mark, we'll go turn back to, Genesis, or to Revelation. Turn back to, actually turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. It was put there to protect Cain. All right, that's why it was there. It's distinct from a number. Uh, the number and the mark are two different things. Uh, the mark is not 666, like some people will tell you. I've heard that from the time I was knee high to a grasshopper. The mark of the beast is 666. No, it's not. That's the number. The mark and the number are two different things. And we know this because of verse 16 and verse 17 of Revelation chapter 3, or Revelation chapter 13. So, uh, I, I saw the movie years ago when I was a young boy. My mom and dad watched it on TV, and I wasn't supposed to watch it, and, and I did. Um, I snuck around the corner while they watched it, and I watched it, and this movie was called The Omen. And that whole movie was based on the premise of the Antichrist, and that Antichrist had a mark underneath his, his, his hair, 666, okay? Um, and the whole point of that movie was that the Antichrist is here on earth now, and anybody that didn't get 666 put on their body 
uh, would get their head cut off. All right, so, so with that thought in mind, um, don't let Hollywood determine what the mark is. A lot of people thought after that movie, oh, the mark is 666. I remember in rock and roll band, I used to listen to, uh, when I was younger, a band called Iron Maiden. And they sang a song called The Mark of the Beast. And it quoted Revelation chapter 13 in the song. And I just at that time lost uh, uh, being a wicked kid and all that. Uh, just really enjoyed that song because it was so awesome, you know, and it really wasn't. Um, they knew more about the mark of the beast and, and the number of the beast than, than most Bible scholars do. And here they are, a rock and roll band, you know. So, so turn to Acts chapter 17. And here's what's interesting about uh, the word in Genesis and the word that's in um, Revelation that we just read. I'm having a hard time finding Acts. So here's what Acts 17, verse 29 says. For as much that as we are the offspring of God, we ought not think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver, or a stone, or graven by art in man's device. There's something interesting about the word graven there. It's translated into the English word graven, but it came out of the same root word that the word mark, or the same word that the word mark comes out of in the book of Revelation. And in art, uh, sometimes when they're marking their materials, they say that they put a grave mark on it. And, and that's basically what it is. You're marking uh, something. And that's what God did to Cain, and that is exactly what the Antichrist is going to do in the book of Revelation. Um, if, in fact, um, it was what some people have said it was, um, in our generation. Let me ask you something. What are they saying it is in our generation? Now, I've heard this for years. It's a chip, right? It's a chip they're going to put in your hand. Or it's a chip they're going to put in your head. They use it in animals. Two of our animals have this chip. Uh, there's, there's preachers all across America that taught for years, it's the chip, it's the chip, it's the chip. Um, no, it's not. It's a mark. It's not a chip. It's a mark. Does that have something to do with end time prophecy? It absolutely does. I mean, there is something to the chip, uh, but it's not the mark of the beast. And if it was the mark of the beast, guess what? Every bit of doctrine that we preach about getting raptured out of the church or raptured out of this age uh, before the tribulation period comes, guess what that does? That puts us in the tribulation because we're raptured out before that mark is even put on people. And they're already using the chip on people. They put it on criminals. Uh, you can go get a chip in your kid if you want in case they get kidnapped. That's what everybody is saying the mark is. It's not. It's a mark. It's a mark. And uh, we're going we're to prove that with Scripture. All right? So um, what is it? Um, I, I'll tell you what it's not. Number one, every generation has something that is predominantly uh, what the uh, churches claim to be the mark of the beast. All right? In my generation, it's the chip. I've heard this, like I said, I've heard this for years. I've heard it from Van Imp. I've heard it from um, other guys that I have a high regard for as far as their scriptural knowledge. Um, and it, but it can't be unless they believe the church is not raptured out before the tribulation period comes. And when you get them nailed to the wall, you find out Van Imp believes the church goes into the tribulation. That's why he can claim the mark is the chip. A lot of other Bible scholars believe that. T.D. Jakes uh, believes that. There's a lot of Calvinists that believe that. There's people all over America that you would independent fundamental Baptist, but their doctrine is not premillennial like ours is. Their doctrine is not millennial, or their doctrine is uh, halfway through the tribulation period, God's saints gets raptured out. There is a rapture in the tribulation period. But it's not God's saints in this church age, it's the Jewish people. Uh, there is a rapture in that, and that's where you get mixed up. Uh, rightly dividing the Word of God. Every time there's a phrase, and there's one word different in that phrase, it could very well mean a different thing. And we'll talk about that when we study First and uh, Second Thessalonians here in a minute. Um, so, my generation, it was the mark. You know what it was in, in my parents' generation? The banking industry came up with these cards. And all of a sudden, you had to have those cards to buy and sell. And, and it was a, like a one, and matter of fact, it is today. Uh, we talk about a currency of the world. 
you can take your credit card, get online on Amazon or any of these other places, and you can buy something from China right now. But do you have to trade your currency right in? It does it all automatically for you, don't it? So your card can buy something from China. Your card can buy something that costs a peso. Your bar can go up to uh, Canada. Your card can buy something from Canada with the Canucks. I mean, there's all kinds of things. You can go um, anywhere in the world with that card and buy anything you want. All right, so I've heard people say in my parents' generation, as soon as the banking industry went to this card, it was the way of marking everybody. That's the mark of the beast. No, it's not. <laughs> um, my grandparents' generation, remember, uh, some of you may remember this, I don't know. Remember when Social Security numbers weren't popular and they started putting them on people? You know how many churches were crying out, that's the mark, that's the mark, that's the mark? Look at your church history and look at some of these old-time Bible people that are good men. Don't get me wrong. Uh, they're good men. We'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, some of the things they were saying about the Social Security number. And here's what happens. Every generation has a teaching of what that mark is. All right? But it changes with every generation also. Uh, now, to me, is that letting the Bible interpret the events or is that letting the events interpret the Bible? It's dangerous when you do it the other way around. Um, they're basing the Word of God concerning the mark on current events rather than rightly dividing the Word of truth. So when we study uh, the Word of God, we need to be absolutely 100% careful that we do not interpret it according to what's going on around us. Uh, because it's very easy to take something uh, that's happening in current events and say, oh, this is what the Bible's talking about. No, the Bible needs to explain it. You don't need to use it to explain the Bible. And a good example of that, and, and a, I, I've got some great men, great teachers in my life that I've had. High regard, high respect, but I don't agree with them on everything. And one of those things that I don't agree with them on is I've heard this for years, that the Antichrist is the Pope. Now, he's an Antichrist. He absolutely is. But when you read Revelation and you, you read about where uh, the seat of Satan is, the seat of Satan is in the place that Antipas was persecuted, where he was persecuted for the faith. You know where he was persecuted at? Turkey. Not Rome. So the seat that Antichrist rises out of is actually in the land of Turkey. And what's interesting about that is the Roman Catholic Church is in bad shape now. It has been for the last few years. And the Muslim faith is beginning to grow. And it's getting very strong. And now the, the Roman Catholic Church and also the Muslims are starting to join together in many things. And they're trying to bring all religions into one central belief. Now, Constantine did that. That's why we have Christmas. That's why we celebrate Easter and we all these things. He did all that. He made all faiths one. That's why it's called Christmas and all this stuff. We won't get into that, but um, I love these holidays. I love to celebrate them. But I'm telling you, there's some paganism to them because of what Constantine, Constantine did. He brought all beliefs together so that they can all get along. It's called eucumenicalism. And that's exactly what's happening overseas right now and in America. They're trying to bring all religions together so we can all just get along. Uh, you can't do that. Truth is truth. And if somebody doesn't believe what the truth is, I don't want to associate with them when it comes to religious worship, nor when it comes to religious work. I will not do it. I, I, I don't. And um, it's eucumenicalism. The beast is going to arise out of Turkey, out of that seat of Antipas, or seat where Antipas was, was persecuted, and I believe he's going to come in the form of eucumenicalism. And uh, right now, the Roman Catholic Church, they, a lot of people taught that because it was a land that was on seven hills. And the Bible talks about it being a land on seven hills. Well, guess what? There's seven great mountains over there in Turkey. So why can't it be Turkey? Now, whether they agree with me or not, I don't care. And they don't care whether I agree with them or not. But we got to go by what the Bible says, not by what we've heard through all these years. Um, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, we interpret the Word of God by the Word of God, not by the events that are around us. Uh, so uh, we have many teachings. Um, grandparents' time, like I said, it was Social Security numbers. I remember reading history about when the telephone came to be and how people thought that was uh, no doubt part of Bible prophecy, but they believed that had something to do with the mark. It, it doesn't. The mark, the Bible says, is a mark. It's a mark in the Bible. It's not a chip. 
Um, it's not a social security card. It's not a social security number. It's not a, a card that we carry or an identification. Um, I've heard people talk about how it's, they're putting these things in our bodies to wholeness so that they know where we're at. You know what? I don't know where mine's at, but um, we already got them. We, we don't have to go to some doctor to get it implanted in us. You know what it's called? Our cell phone, our GPS on our cars, um, our computers, everything we do. If you've ever looked at Google, guess what? They know a lot about you just by the word searches that you do in Google. So, um, you know, current events are current events. Don't base scripture on current events. Base the current events on scripture. There's a big difference there. Uh, so you say, well, what is it? What is it? Um, well, don't get me wrong. I believe all these things are part of biblical prophecy, but they're not the mark. Um, so turn over to, to Revelation. We're going to study some of these, these scriptures. We, we talked about Revelation chapter uh, uh, 13, uh, verses 16 and 17. It says this, And he causeth all, both great and small, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. So you can get that mark in one of two places. You can get it on your forehead or you can get it in your hand. All right, now... Here's my question to you. Does N mean eternal? Internal? Does it mean that it's internal? Uh, what determines what a word means in Scripture? The context, right? Uh, you want to study the Bible and understand it, you've got to keep things in context. And because of our English words, uh, they can have several different meanings, even though it's the same word. A good example of that is the word let. It means to allow, and it can also mean to disallow. Um, and that's why the scripture we're, we, we read in, or we're going to read in Thessalonians, one scripture has both words, but they mean two different things. The same word, let, in one scripture, twice, they mean two different things because of context. So this word in, in the Bible, um, what's in my hand? Is it inside my hand? But it's in my hand, right? I'm holding it in my hand. So I've had people say, well, it's inside. It's inside your hand. That must mean it's the chip. No, because if it has to be inside the body, why wouldn't they put it inside the forehead? Context determines what the word means, because the word in can mean internal, and it can also mean being held. God holds us in his hand, right? I, I, I'm holding a quarter in my hand. Does that mean it's inside my skin? No, it just means I'm holding it in my hand. So that word in there means in your hand. Mark right there. Palm of your hand. So you close your hand, that mark's in your hand. You open your hand, you can see that mark. Or you get the mark on your forehead. All right, so, or in their foreheads. Now, um, is it the number 666? And it's not. And we know this because of what 17 says. And that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So there are three different things. The number of the beast, of course, we know is 666 because of what it says in the next few scriptures. The name, um, you know, we'll get into that in a later study, but um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this man by the name of Judas Iscariot um, at some point through our Revelation study and some, some thoughts about him, the son of perdition, uh, the only man in the Bible that says that he went to his own place, called um, the SOP. Um, he's, he's called um, actually the genuine article of Satan in the Bible uh, by Jesus. So uh, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 14, verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, all right, so it's a mark. And the smoke of their torment ascended up in verse 11, uh, forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So what does that tell you about the mark? Mark of his name. So you know what that means? That tells you what that mark is going to be, just in that scripture right there. Um, not only does uh, the, the, uh, the, the beast have a name, but he also has a symbol of that name. That's what that mark is. It's some, I believe, some sort of symbol. Is it a barcode? Um, can there be symbols in barcodes? There can. Um, I don't know. Um, but 
but I do because of this scripture right, right here, receiveth the mark of his name. So, uh, not of his name, not receiveth his name, but the mark of his name. Uh, verse 15, or verse 2 of chapter 15 of Revelation, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of gold. And the first went and poured out, in verse 2 of 16, his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which were deceived, which, de, which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and then that worshipped, worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of burning with a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Now that's the second death it's talking about there. All right, and then in verse twenty or verse four of chapter twenty. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon they, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. Revelation chapter twenty verse four is one of the go-to scriptures for people that believe that the church does not get, that some of the people in the church age go into the tribulation. And they say that because it talks about them that were beheaded for who? For Jesus. All right. In the Bible, in the book of Revelation, John was told to write about things, three things. Things he saw, things he sees, and things he's going to see. All right. What Revelation chapter 20 verse 4 is, is it's a combination of all ages, of all persecutions through the church age. There's been many, uh, there's some main ones. So this first group in verse 4, uh, judgment was given on them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. For the witness of Jesus, right? That's not talking about those that went into the tribulation. That's talking about those in our church age. That's talking about the wall of sins. That's talking about your, um, your polycarps. That's talking about uh, the, the Christians that were thrown into the lion's uh, pits. That's talking about the games that, that, uh, that Caesar and all them played uh, uh, to kill Christians. That's talking about the time of Constantine. That's talking about all the religious wars where Christians. That's talking about uh, the, 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 the slaughter of Bartholomew and, and all that stuff. That's what it's talking about all the way up until the final day of the church age when we're raptured out of here. And that tells me something. Uh, there may be a time before we get out of here, before God comes and takes His church out of here, where we're going to be standing before the chopping block for our faith. And we live in a country, <laughs> we live in a world right now that the slightest bit of fear about something that could hurt them, they throw the towel in. They say, you know what, I'll stand, I'll stand, I'll stand, I'll stand. Praise the Lord, I won't, I'll do this and I'll do that. And all of a sudden, oh, I can, I can break my finger or something, I'm not going to do that. Oh, somebody might not like me, they might say a word to me when I knock on their door. Oh, somebody might this and might that. Guess what? Do you think that they're going to be able to stand for Jesus Christ when it comes time to get their head chopped off if they say they stand for him? Or would it be much easier to say, I'll recant. I'm going to do it for my wife. I'm going to do it for my kids. I'm going to do it for my, for, for my brothers and my moms and my dads. They need me. They need a witness here. You know what? I hope, and I don't know what I'm going to do if it comes to that, but I hope I've got enough God in me and I allow him to pour that new grace on me and that I can stand faithful and die for my Savior, Jesus Christ. Our persecution now is emotional. One day in America, it will be physical. And we are approaching that day pretty fast. So they messed that scripture up right there uh, because he's looking back of all ages. And then it says this, or in their hands, and, because of the words, the words are and in there, which is very interesting that the word and is in there because it means a combination of things in different times in this portion of scripture. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Who gets to reign with Christ a thousand years? We do, don't we, if we're faithful. Isn't that right? So how can this only happen, be talking about all those in the tribulation period? It can't. It's talking about all different ages. All right, so turn over to uh, Titus 
um, chapter 2, verse 13. So we're going to look at when this mark happens. Um, every scripture concerning the mark that we're, that we're talking about today happens during a particular time in this Bible and in, in the age. Um, and what is this time? This mark that's being talked about in Revelation is not a mark that we even have an opportunity to get. We don't get it. We don't even have a chance to get it. It's not even revealed what that mark is going to be yet because it does not happen until Revelation, some, somewhere two and a half, three years, three and a half years into the book of Revelation, uh, just before the Jews realized that, oh my, uh, this Messiah is a false Messiah that we've been bowing down and worshiping. And uh, so in Titus, uh, we're going to look at the book of Thessalonians first and second. We're going to talk about one event that takes place at two different, in two different portions. Titus chapter 2 verse 13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, so that scripture is telling us, as Christians, we've got a hope to look for, right? I preached on that, uh, I think, Sunday, wasn't it? Well, on hope, our blessed hope. Uh, the idea that we can hope because of a resurrected Savior and our resurrection. Because if He raised Himself, He has the power to raise us. So now turn over uh, to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Here's what the Bible says. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. Verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout and the voice of an archangel, of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The scriptures that we just read here are concerning our hope. Uh, our hope in the resurrection of our bodies uh, from the grave. Uh, knowing that our end here on earth is just the beginning of our eternity. And in 1 Thessalonians, it is referring to a particular event. Um, anybody care to guess what that event is? The what? The rapture. When does that happen? What? Yes. That happens at the first part of what's called the second advent. All right. And you're right. It's when Christ comes back. Um, the second advent is broken down into two portions. The first portion is when he comes and takes his church. The second portion, part of that second advent, happens in the book of Revelation. All right. So, um, the word they, if you, if you look at the word they, um, let me find it here. Remember, I said every word is important. Every word. And I love the little ors and the theys and the thems, all that stuff, because those truly... Uh, bring scriptures together. All right, so if you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and um, we're, we're going to look at the word they um, in verse 3 of chapter uh, 5, actually. All right, uh, look, at, look at chapter 5. All right, the Bible says, verse 1, and it's a continuation of chapter 4. But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, ye have not need that I write unto you. And the reason he didn't need to write unto him is because we know the times and the seasons. We may not know the day, but we know the times of the season. And what was going on in the book of Thessalonians is there was a lot of false teachers. They were coming on the scene and teaching people that, hey, uh, the rapture's already happened. And now you're in the tribulation period. And there was a lot of, a lot of persecution back there. And there's a difference between the word persecution and the word tribulation. There's a diff there are different words. And there's no doubt uh, they were in great persecution at the time. People were being killed. And they were getting confused and getting worried because they thought, oh no, the tribulation started and the raptures happened and we're still here. 
And a lot of false teachings came out of that age because people started to believe that. And then they started teaching, well, then, you know, if God promised he's coming back to get his people, he must be coming back in a revelation. And all kinds of things came out of that. And all kinds of old school Bible scholars caught on to some of those false teachings and grabbed it. Paul was warning the, book of, warning the people in Thessalonica, you know, watch out. Here's what God taught, and I'm going to tell you exactly what he taught. And he taught that the, there was a second advent coming, and it was in two parts. He's going to take his church out, and then he's going to come back again. All right, so in verse 5, but of the times in this, verse 1 of chapter 5, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For ye yourselves, for yourselves know perfectly, now listen, that the day of the Lord, remember that phrase, the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. All right, how does a thief come? He comes when people sleeping, right? He comes when nobody's home. He comes when it's dark. He comes when he knows it's the safest time to go in and steal and kill. All right, well, it says that God, when he comes back, when the day of the Lord happens, he's going to come as a thief in the night. People aren't going to be expecting it. Uh, they're going to be unaware, and he's going to take people out. And just like that, if you're saved and your brother's not, you're gone, and your brother's still here. And then the Bible says, God shall send them strong delusion. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That believe a lie is going to happen in the tribulation period where they believe that the Antichrist is actually the Messiah. The Bible says it fools God's very elect. So even the Jews are fooled uh, by this cat for three and a half years. And then in verse 3, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. What it's talking about in chapter 5, it's referring to the event of the rapture, and then it starts talking about after the rapture, the beginning of the tribulation period. And they, in verse 3, is referring to them in verse 12 of chapter 4. Turn to chapter 12, or verse 12 of chapter 4. That ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. And the them that are without is speaking of those people that are not saved. So verse 12, he's talking to them, and he's saying, I would not have you ignorant the next verse. He said, God's going to take you out of here. And once he takes you out of here, you can comfort, you can comfort each other with the words that he's going to take you out of here. And then once he takes you out of here, all of a sudden some other things are going to happen. And he goes into chapter 5, and he talks about because of these things, you need to walk uprightly. You need to walk with a good testimony because what you do, them that are without are going to be paying attention to you. And you could very well be the difference between them getting saved and them not getting saved and then them getting raptured out because they seen your life and your testimony and they accepted Christ as their Savior. And then chapter 5 begins. And that's saying, now these events are going to take place. And remember, I said the day of the Lord. Now, uh, what I want you to think about, uh, the events in chapter 4 of Thessalonians is talking about a completely different event than what 2 Thessalonians is talking about. So turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Chapter 4 happens before the tribulation. In verse, uh, um, chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians happens after, the tri or after the, the uh, rapture of the church. So chapter 4 is, is before the rapture, and then the rapture, chapter uh, uh, 2 of First Thessalonians is speaking of what happens after the rapture in the tribulation period. So it says in verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. So, verse 2, That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter from us, as, they, as, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, is that the same as the day of the Lord? I want you, how many people in here have a Schofield Bible? Just by a show of hands. I want you to look at the, in that scripture, I want you to look at the, the, the footnote, he, or not the footnote, but the uh, note that he has for that phrase, the day of the Lord, or the day of Christ. In 2 Thessalonians, I'm trying to find it here also, because um, it's in, yeah, there we go. All right. So in 2 Thessalonians, here's what the Word of God says. Remember I said these, there's some great Bible scholars out there, but they're not always right. 
And if we base what we believe on what they say, we're going to get ourselves mixed up. So the Bible says this in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away. First, and the man of sin be revealed, uh, the son of perdition. All right, so verse 2, it says, Neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Now, look over to the right in the center column in that first note. What does it say? Who has the Schofield Bible? What does it say? What does Schofield's note say of, at letter A? But what does the first, before that reference, what does it say? Day of the Lord. Is that what the Bible says? Does it say the day of Christ or does it say the day of the Lord? Day of Christ, doesn't it? Are those two different days? The day of the Lord is referring to the whole second advent. The day of Christ is referring to the first advent, or the, the, second, the first part of the second advent, which is the day of, of the rapture. So you turn over to uh, the book of Isaiah, and this is where people get mixed up. All right? Schofield changed the word of God from the, the day of Christ to the day of the Lord. It's not talking about the same event. So turn over to Isaiah, chapter 12, or chapter 2, I mean. And here's what verse 12 says. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. Does that sound like the rapture? No. When you put the day of the Lord in there, guess what? You've just taken the rapture out of verse 2 and you turned it into the second part of the second advent of Christ. Because that second advent when he comes is exactly what Isaiah chapter 2 verse 12 is talking about. That second part of that second advent. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty and upon everyone that is lifted up and has, he shall be brought low. And that will definitely happen at the second advent. Because people are proud. And he's going he's gonna to settle them down. All right, so... We'll continue on, and we'll close up uh, here shortly. Uh, verse 4, who, and it says this, it says this in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means. They were being deceived by some letters that were forged, I believe. For that day shall not come. What day is it talking about? For that day shall not come. For that day shall not come. Except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The day of Christ is at hand. We get raptured out. Chapter 5 happens of 2 Thessalonians. That day that it's talking about is 2 Thessalonians chapter 5. Or 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I mean. That day says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, what day is it talking about? That second part when Christ comes in the, in the tribulation period. Except there come in a fall away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. All right, let me ask you something. If we are in the tribulation period like some people are teaching right now, is the son of perdition revealed? Who is the son of perdition? Does anybody know? We don't, do we? I got an idea who it is. I believe it's Judas. He's called the son of perdition. Jesus called him that. Um, all this stuff. I believe that. And I believe God sent him back to his own place. But I also believe the Antichrist has been on earth before. He came in the form of Nimrod. I believe he came in the form of, um, of, 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 of Nimr, which is, t which is, um, which is Nimrod. Um, I believe he came in other forms. Uh, but, and I believe he came in, in, in the body of Judas. And we'll, we'll talk about that in Scripture. And it's not a, uh, it's not a you got to believe this or you don't believe it. It's, it's nothing like that. Um, do I know for a fact it's Judas? I don't know. Uh, but I believe Judas is coming back. I believe Judas was different than any other man that's ever been born on this earth by man and woman. And, um, and just because of some of the things that Jesus said to him. But we'll, we'll get into that. So who is this son of perdition? Um, and when will he be revealed? He's not going to be revealed for who he is until three and a half years into the tribulation period. He's going to be sitting to see the Satan. He's going to be sitting up there, and he's going to be bringing all people to him, 
and he's, he's going to have them bow down and worship him. And if you do not bow down and worship him, or you do not take the mark, or you do not take um, the uh, forehead or the hand, what's going to happen to you? You're going to get beheaded. And as soon as the Jews, the remnant, see this happening, what they say is, wait a minute. This is not the Messiah we thought he was. Because they're deceived into thinking he's Jesus. And he's sitting on the throne. He's setting his kingdom up. The Jewish people have always looked for the literal kingdom. All right? They've looked for the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we're in the kingdom of God right now. It's a spiritual type thing that's within us. And, and we know this because of Galatians. <laughs> but but so, so with that all in mind, here's the thought that I'm going to leave you with, and, and we'll continue on here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is a completely different event than 1 Thessalonians or 2 Thessalonians chapter 5. And this revealing of the son of perdition does not happen until the tribulation period. And that revealing comes when he calls out everybody to get the mark. And those that don't get the mark, he begins to kill. And at that point, the Jewish people realize this is the son of perdition. And the son of perdition is then revealed. So my question is this. Do we have to worry about the mark in our age? So if it is the chip... We're messed up, aren't we? So don't worry about it. Yes. Show it to me in Scripture. It, it, it's not there. And, and the only way they re, they're able to come up with an idea like that is because they're wrong in the beginning, and they're trying to keep themselves right because they got a lot of followers. I, I, I am a big fan of Schofield. Um, I, I truly am. I'm a big fan of his. Uh, but some of the times that he corrects the Word of God is mind-boggling. I can tell you some Bible... Uh, I, I highly regard Oliver B. Green, uh, Dr. Tabb, Peter Ruckman, Sam Gipp, uh, Bill Grady, um, I, oh, Ironsides. I, I, these guys are great. J. Vernon McGee. I mean, these guys are smart men, and, and I've gleaned a lot off of them. But almost every one of them pull this... Well, the correct rendering should be this. Uh, I, I, I've talked about Oliver e. Green. I, I recommend his commentaries to everybody I talk to because they're so down to earth and easy to understand. But you've got to be careful because sometimes, even though he was a King James Bible man, uh, sometimes he'll say, the, well, the word should have been rendered this way. And then he explains in a way to where you think he's not trying to correct the word of God, but in reality, just like Schofield, he's correcting the word of God. And when you start changing the words that are in this book, you've just put yourself in a predicament because it's going to mess up doctrine. Every jot and tittle is important in this book. Every comma, every period, every capital letter. And as soon as you change one word, the day of Christ, to it means the day of the Lord, you've just messed up the two advents of Christ. And you've just taken that, that scripture, based it on that, and said, well, I guess we can go into the tribulation period. Because if that's referring to the day of the Lord, um, the whole thing, then I guess I'm going into the tribulation period. Well, guess what? If it's the mark, it's the same predicament. If the chip's the mark, if the social security number was the mark, if the telephones were the mark, if, if the, uh, the implants in our body was the mark... Uh, we're all most miserable because that means Christ's not coming back to get us before the tribulation period. And that's a heresy that's being taught by some of the... Uh, uh, I'll tell you what, and, and I like Jack Van Imp. His historical knowledge is mind-boggling to me. I put him right up there with Josephus. Uh, but he's got this whole second advent of Christ really messed up. And so many people follow him because he taught it, it must be true. I, 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 Dr. Tapp, man, I'm, I told you I'm a big fan of his. But his whole teaching on Revelation about uh, who the, uh, uh, the Antichrist is and where he comes from, and he, he teaches that it's the Pope, um, and he teaches that he comes out of Rome, it doesn't line up with Scripture. It, it just doesn't. And he based it on back then, back when, when he wrote uh, his, his study on Revelation, he based it on the, the idea that most people generally believed because everything sort of lined up. But it's got to completely line up, not sort of line up. And it's not the only one that it could be. It could be Turkey. And according to the book of Revelation, his seat is in Turkey. It's in the land where Anapis was martyred. 
Uh, we'll cover that when we cover the church ages. So uh, with that, um, think about those two scriptures. Go home, study those two. Uh, chapter uh, 4 of 1 Thessalonians and chapter f- uh, 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 2 of, of 2 Thessalonians. And, and, uh, and I'll tell you, it's, it's going to be an interesting um, time when people get that mark and they think it's the end of them as Christians. Because these people are going to get the vaccine. Uh, you're going to, they're, they're already talking about making people get a, a shot to test them to see if they have this coronavirus. They're talking about making people get uh, the vaccine or they can't go into the stores. They're already doing it in some states. You can't walk into a store unless you're wearing a mask. And uh, Ohio is going to probably follow that very soon because our wonderful governor, Michael DeWine, wants to outdo every other governor. <laughs> you know, so I said it. Um, but anyway, with that, we'll go ahead and close, and um, we'll finish, um, we'll, we'll continue this up next week, and, and uh, praise the Lord, one day we're going to be called away, and we ain't got to worry about none of this stuff anyway. So let's pray. Dear Lord God, we come to you today, just thank you for this time. Lord, thank you for the book of Revelation. Uh, Lord, uh, give us wisdom. Help us, Lord, to um, uh, study these scriptures, letting you interpret them for us, God.